You probably think the more motivation you have, the better. Well, be careful what you wish for. I've watched brilliant entrepreneurs destroy multi-million dollar companies because they couldn't handle their own drive. Today, you'll learn the counterintuitive science of how to harness extreme motivation without letting it destroy you. Now, I'm Rian Doris, founder and CEO of flowstate.com. We've trained everyone from Audi Accenture and the US Air Force to use neuroscience-based principles to access flow states at will. Now, let me tell you about burning up. Years ago, I was in my mid 20s riding high on momentum. It was 5 a.m., no alarm needed, my eyes snapped open, ideas bursting out of my brain, firing off messages to my team with a kind of frenzied certainty, new product launches, team expansions, new marketing channels. And this wasn't just motivation that I was experiencing, it was something else. And things got increasingly reckless. In a matter of weeks, I bought a new company. I enrolled in a PhD program. I dropped six figures on a domain name. I hosted 400 person parties, every night being a gamble with cease and desist orders. I hired AI engineers after binge reading a few articles on machine learning and even installed a hyperbaric oxygen chamber in my home office because, well, why not? The tipping point though came when I convinced my team that we should split the company into two distinct focused operations. This is when the cracks started showing. Within weeks, people started quitting. Deadlines doubled, brilliant ideas turned into expensive misfires. What felt initially like unstoppable momentum and almost over whelming motivation were actually the early signs of me burning up. Now here's the paradox, the force pushing you to new heights can also send you crashing down. Building momentum is tough, but once you're rolling with flow state on tap in abundance and winds continuing to pile up, your confidence soars. Now usually this is good, but as Stephen Kotler and a leading researcher on peak performance and flow put it, flow makes you feel invincible right up to the moment that you're not. The rush and high you get from the seemingly perfect decisions made in flow can become your enemy. And the research backs this up. It's something that happens when you reach a certain level of performance. There's a syndrome that plagues amateurs. It's when motivation dies and energy evaporates and you've heard of it, it's called burnout. But there exists a less spoken of yet equally formidable cousin of this syndrome. If burnout is the slow extinguishing of your flame, imagine now it's opposite. Not a dimming, but an inferno raging out of control. Here, cynicism is replaced with a kind of optimism so intense it borders on delusion. Self-efficacy doesn't just grow, but balloons. One experiences wild wild horse level erratic energy in this state. Rather than burning out, think of this as burning up. This syndrome is underpinned by a DSM-5 validated psychological condition, and it's known as hypomania. Hypomania is characterized by racing mood, decreased need for sleep, and insatiable appetite for work and risk-taking. Now, hypomania was first explored in the late 19th century. Psychiatrists noticed a pattern. Some patients exhibited elevated mood, energy, and productivity that fell between normalcy and full-blown mania. And these patients, while showing manic symptoms, remained functional and often excelled. The idea of hypomania as a success catalyst further gained traction with John Gartner's 2005 book, The Hypomanic Edge. Gartner argued that hypomania has shaped America's entrepreneurial spirit and innovation. His theory actually suggested a genetic filter. Think about it, who leaves everything behind to sail across an ocean toward a life of complete and utter uncertainty? Well, according to Gartner, it was primarily people with hypomanic traits who decided to move from Europe to America in the first place, creating a culture in the US wired for innovation, bold action, and an almost compulsive push towards success. On a neurotransmitter level, hypomania is marked by heightened dopamine activity, fueling motivation and increasing reward-seeking behavior. Increased norepinephrine levels, driving energy and alertness, and then dysregulated serotonin, which can affect mood stability. Now this neurochemical cocktail is what gives hypomania its intoxicating blend of energy, confidence, and creativity. But hypomania can tip so easily into impulsivity irritability, grandiosity, distorted reality. Just as unaddressed burnout leaves you with no gas to drive, unchecked hypomania will crash your car into a wall. Amateurs need to learn how to accelerate. High performers often need to learn how to decelerate. You might be thinking that hypomania doesn't apply to you, but once you know the signs, you're gonna start spotting it everywhere. So maybe it was someone cornering you at a network event, talking at you rather than to you, their eyes wide, words spilling out faster than their thoughts, more interested in hearing themselves speak than having a conversation. Or like my other friend who, in the grip of hypomania, became convinced that modern marketing was morally corrupt. Socrates, Plato, and Jesus Christ 
would never market or sell like this, he once said to me. So why should I? He was ready to torch his seven-figure business based on a philosophical revelation that had struck him between his fourth and fifth espresso and resulted in him comparing himself to Christ and Socrates. These are the red flags of hypomania. And this isn't a rare glitch, it's a default challenge on the path to high performance. If you don't learn how to navigate it, it's not a question of will it sabotage you, it's a question of when. This is because the same neurochemical processes fueling hypomania also fuel flow states. Flow states are characterized by a balance of neurotransmitters like dopamine, which enhances focus and motivation. However, an excess of dopamine, which can occur during prolonged periods of flow without proper regulation, may contribute to hypomanic behavior. If you're not careful. You see, hypomania is mischanneled flow. It's flow gone too far. If you struggle with this, great. It means you have a high flow predisposition. The problem isn't flow itself. It's not being equipped to handle the intense neurological power that comes with regular access to profound, deep flow states. Now, before we go further, it's important to clarify, this isn't a medical diagnosis. And if you're experiencing extreme mood fluctuations or symptoms that disrupt your life, you should seek professional guidance. I'm not qualified to give you guidance on your mental health in that respect. So how do we harness Flo's power without tipping over into hypomania and burning up? Well, the first step is to stop, drop, and roll. If you're in or on the brink of a hypomanic state, there's a simple solution, and it's something you may have learned in elementary school. Stop, drop, and roll. The first step is to stop. When you notice the signs of hypomania, decreased need for sleep, racing thoughts, increased risk-taking, inflated self-esteem, boosted conviction in all your own plans and ideas to a degree that may be a little high, it's crucial to put the brakes on. You want to think of hypomanic energy like a high-performance sports car. The difference between an amateur and a professional is that the amateur pushes the pedal to the floor until they spin out, while a professional knows exactly how far they can push it while maintaining control. Stop, drop, and roll is your break, so you can maintain control like a pro. Remember, when hypomania strikes, the prefrontal cortex, which handles impulse control and rational planning, gets overpowered by the striatum, the brain's reward hub, driving grandiosity, risk-taking, and short-term focus. When you stop, you re-engage the prefrontal cortex for clear, more balanced decisions. When I was in a hypomanic state, I was like a rocket ship hurtling through space, fueled by pure ambition and drive, but definitely losing control. And that's when my friend Liam called. He'd been watching from the sidelines, seeing what I couldn't see. Rian, he said, you need to take a week off now. A week off felt impossible, even irresponsible with all this momentum, but Liam insisted. So I did something unprecedented for me at the time. I took an emergency week off, texted everyone, dropped work completely. When my business partner reached out the next day, my body told me everything I needed to know. I felt physically ill, almost tweaking out after the decreased stimulation. That week became my lifeline. My brother and I hiked through Malibu, letting nature's quiet soothe my frayed nerves. Daily saunas, ice baths, no caffeine, no stimulants. What I was doing was counteracting the effects of hypomania by increasing interoception and embodiment. A lot of people will refer to this as becoming more grounded. And as this happened, the cognitive activity started to quiet down. Awareness began to shift down throughout the rest of the nervous system and the rest of the body, diffusing the excess hypomanic energy. After seven days, the erratic energy and flighty thoughts faded, replaced by a clarity, a calm, composed way of thinking and being that I hadn't felt in months. So here's how to drop. First, ditch the stimulants, caffeine, energy drinks, anything that artificially revs you up needs to go temporarily. Your system is already in overdrive. Next, dial down. Reduce the barrage of stimulation. Step away from screens, notifications, and anything that ramps up your senses. And of course, hit pause on work. Yes, even if you're crushing, when hypomania fuels success, it's tempting to run with it, but that's the path to burning up. Next, aggressively activate your parasympathetic nervous system. This is your body's rest and digest mode. Sauna, cold plunge, massage, the active recovery tools that we tend to emphasize are all key here to kickstart the relaxation response and get a parasympathetic spike of activity. And move your body. Think of it as a tiring out exercise. You're almost like an overexcited puppy, and for that puppy to be able to sleep, it needs to run around a little bit to the point that it can become fatigued enough to be able to rest. Fatigue your system so you can sleep even more deeply. Even better is to do this out in nature, like I did with my brother. Expose yourself to nature to make yourself feel smaller and to be reminded of what matters. It also helps to spend time with loved ones. Hypomania can lead to the delusion of invincibility, but loved ones, the ones who see our flaws and our baseline, crack that facade for us. Your intimate other knows your baseline so intimately that you can only veer so far off without getting called out. So now you've stopped. That brings us to the next step in stop, drop, and roll, which is to drop 
the long-term decisions. This includes hitting pause on strategic business decisions. Put off any major commitments, purchases, or strategic moves until you've had a chance to land back down to earth, until your brain chemistry returns to baseline. And that brings us to the last step of stop, drop, and roll, and that is to roll with the hypomania to a degree, safely. Hypomania, when harnessed and directed, can be a lethal competitive advantage. Some of the most impressive feats of human achievement have been fueled by a sprinkle of hypomania. But it's hypomania plus the ability to ground and control that energy and drive that produces profound results. The way to roll with and harness that hypomanic energy is to build a reality reinforcement field. When you're in a hypomanic state, your conviction and enthusiasm can be so intense that it creates a reality distortion field. You might be convinced and able to convince others to make major life-altering decisions. You become so persuasive that even your most trusted advisors can get swept up in the absolute irrefutable logic of your grandiose plans, reinforcing your distorted thinking without realizing it. And this is dangerous because the very people you need who can pull you out of your reality distortion field become persuaded in all of your enthusiasm into your reality. You've probably heard of this with Steve Jobs. Steve Jobs' reality distortion field could drive Apple to greatness, but it could also backfire. Consider the Apple Lisa. He envisioned a revolutionary computer years ahead of its time, but the technology wasn't ready. And the machine itself was slow and unreliable. Sales were terrible, and this failure damaged relationships so deeply within Apple that it led to Jobs being removed from the project. Now, I'll never forget the moment I realized the full extent of the damage my hypomanic flurry had caused. It was like waking up after a wild party to find your house trashed. Except in this case, the house was my life and business and I was the one who trashed it. I knew I had to clean it up, but the task seemed daunting. I started by hacking off all the dispersive elements that had accumulated during this hypomanic spree. One by one, I sliced off the tangential projects, the shiny objects that had distracted me from my core mission and business plan, painful but necessary. In my hypomanic state, I had been planning around what I could do, what I felt capable of in that heightened state, but that wasn't realistic. I was caught in the force of my own reality distortion field, and what I needed to counteract it was a reality reinforcement field. You see, while a reality distortion field bends reality to match your vision, a reality reinforcement field helps you see reality more clearly and holds you accountable to real progress based on objective markers. And there are three steps to building a reality reinforcement field. The first is to channel your hypomanic energy into your main focus. The one thing that you know is the epicenter of your professional world. Feed one fire and starve the rest. Think about it, when your main thing is humming along, generating excitement and building momentum, you're far less likely to be tempted by dispersion, those shiny objects that look appealing but ultimately pull you off course. You take that hypomanic drive and funnel it aggressively into your main thing. Instead of burning up, use it to burn through obstacles. The key to pulling this off is to compress the hypomania into increasingly focused concentric circles. Take all of that energy and drive and they funnel it deeper, not wider. Instead of, I'm gonna launch three different offers, you say, I'm gonna refine one at five times the speed of iteration until it dominates. Instead of, I'll split my time between two businesses, you say, I will make this one business's product so undeniably valuable that expansion becomes an inevitability. Instead of, I'm gonna explore five different strategies, you say, I will execute this one strategy relentlessly, squeezing every drop of value from it before moving on. That's when you achieve the kind of explosive, sustained success that most people only dream of and talk about. Now, the next step to building a reality reinforcement field so you can roll with the hypomania is number two, use numbers to puncture delusion. Don't allow yourself to take the next step until you've consistently hit specific targets. This forces you to earn your way to bigger, potentially riskier commitments. For me, my specific number bound goals were to hit a certain growth rate, a certain revenue number. So I started tracking progress objectively using hard data to ground the subjective experience of progression. By what percentage were my company's profits growing? How much slack in terms of hours that I have with my existing team? The key is to dial up objectivity to an even higher degree than normal, holding yourself accountable to metrics on a monthly, weekly, and even daily basis to counteract the power of the inflated, overly persuasive, and dominant subjectivity that occurs with hypomania. If you see the numbers going down and getting worse, it makes you question whether the subjective conviction you have is real or not. 
As a side note, if you'd like to download an example of a spreadsheet that can act as a reality reinforcement field by having you track key metrics across your life, you can click the link in the description and download that right away, totally free. The last step to building a reality reinforcement field is simple. Manage impulsivity without losing focus. When a new idea strikes, you want to have an impulsivity outlet. Write the idea down, whether it's a business idea, project, book, whatever it is, scope it out. Do the prep work, map out the requirements, build out a document that lays out the whole plan, but do not start building it yet. Scratch the dopamine itch by scoping it out on paper, but then cast it to the side. Usually people find that just scoping it out and mapping out the business plan or writing out a breakdown of what the new role or the new side project or collaboration would look like allows energy to be let out of the system and to hopefully decide if not the move and bring the focus back in to your main mission. So that's how you stop, drop and roll, which is what I eventually did. Looking back, I can see how much energy I wasted on dispersive efforts and grandiose thoughts during that period. If I had channeled that energy into my core pursuit and also known how to push the brake pedal down so I could maintain control of the car, I'd be years ahead of where I am right now today. Now, by the way, it's worth mentioning that there's a strange way that hypomania can manifest itself that looks more like fierce procrastination than frenzied progress. And that is, when you're in the throes of hypomania, it's easy to get high off your own bloviation and bluster. Here's what happens. You get an exciting insight that triggers a hit of dopamine, but then something dangerous happens. You immediately get a second insight about why your first insight is brilliant. Another dopamine hit. Suddenly you realize how this idea solves 10 other problems, even more dopamine. This is why you can spend hours in hypomanic planning sessions convinced you're making massive progress when you're actually just getting drunk on your own thoughts. The dopamine isn't just making you feel good, it's actively rewiring your ability to question yourself. This is the insidious nature of hypomania that you now know how to guard against. As the philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche once said, there are no actors, only actions. This cuts to the heart of one of the most seductive traps in hypomania. Our worth, our impact, our specialness. These things aren't inherent qualities that we're born with or that descend upon us in a moment of hypomanic inspiration. They're the results of our actions, the sum total of what we do in the world. As my longtime business partner, Stephen Kotler wrote in his book, Stealing Fire, don't trust the dopamine. Never trust the dopamine. In fact, use it, but don't believe it. You can use the dopamine, you can ride the high and you can achieve incredible things with it. But in order to not get sabotaged by it, stop, drop and roll when needed. The glow of flow casts a shadow. You can avoid its downsides, by remembering that the feeling of flow is due to temporary neurochemicals. Just like taking a drug, the rush will pass and the contrast between states is part of what makes flow feel so great. Thank you so much for watching and please enjoy the next video, which is gonna show you how to recover, which is one of the key ways to mitigate hypomania.